uh, with that, I will um, introduce uh, Dr. AJ Lindsay. All right. Well, thank you for having me today. Uh, You're like welcome. She said, I'll be just giving a turf update um, and kind of some of the ongoing projects, some of the newer cultivars. Uh, this is just kind of be a glimpse of everything that's going on. We have quite a diverse faculty range that deal with turf grass. Um, like she said, I'm AJ Lindsay. I'm in the Department of Environmental Hort um, here in Gainesville. So I'm located on main campus. And my main focus is on urban turf grass management. So a lot of residential, lawn care, um, but I still do stuff with sports turf and golf courses. Um, and so I do a lot of general management, sustainable management. Um, and so I kind of have a wide, wide range of topics that I study. Before we go into the talk today, I'm just going to give you a brief background of who I am. I am the newest turf grass member at the UF uh, turf team here. I started about a year and a half ago. Um, I was born and raised in northern Wisconsin, uh, so Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Um, from there, I went to the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for my bachelor's. Uh, there, I was focusing on just general biology and chemistry. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so if you look up on the top left of the screen, uh, after I finished my degree, I went and took a job up in remote Alaska. So I was working at Katmai National Park, looking at invasive plant management. Um, and that's kind of where I dove into deciding I wanted to work with plants in the future. But uh, this is a fun challenge, um, remote workplace, uh, but they could actually control the invasive plants within the park. It's such a remote park that there was no uh, road system into it. You had to either boat in or fly in. And so they actually were able to control a lot of the invasive plants within the park. Uh, here's a picture of the working conditions. And so if you ever see these videos or pictures, there's a viewing platform where you can go and see the bears, um, they go fishing. And so this time of the year, they're so focused on fishing, you actually can get pretty close to them. Um, and so these things are um, really quiet, which surprised me. And so they would sneak up on you and kind of get your heart going. Um, so that was a, a fun and challenging work environment. Um, from there, I went back and I took a job in Minnesota. Um, I took a job looking at plant microbes, soil interactions, uh, looking at how plant composition really affects the microbes in the soil. Um, from that, I got sick of winters again. Um, and so I actually went down, as I feel at the bottom left, I went to get my master's at the University of Hawaii. Um, and that's really where I started to dive into turf grass science. And so I did a lot of turf grass weed science while I was there. Um, and so after I finished my master's, I kind of moved back to the Midwest and I got my PhD at Iowa State University. Um, and this is where I really dove into kind of sustainable turf grass management, um, trying to look at some alternative practices and seeing how we can really kind of change the landscape of what we think of in terms of turf grass management. After getting my PhD, uh, like I said, I took the job here, University of Florida. Um, and so now I'm in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and at the end of the presentation, my email, uh, We'll pop up so if you have any other additional questions I always feel free to reach out I'm more than happy to help out when I can um, so like I said this presentation is just going to be on the turf grass updates so kind of what are the newest things that we're looking at um, so I'll go into the cultivars real quickly um, I'll kind of go into some mixed lawns uh, so we have some interesting research looking at mixed species landscapes uh, there's a new soil test that we have at the University of Florida, so I'll go into that and why it's uh, a little more user friendly. Um, we have some projects looking at reclaimed water. We know a lot of areas are starting to utilize reclaimed water, and so we need to figure out how we incorporate that into our best management practices. And then we'll go into soil amendments and fertilizer sources, and this is where I do um, a lot of my work, and so some of this will be my research along with some other colleagues. So just briefly going over the different grasses here in Florida uh, for homeowners. 
Um, and so we kind of have our lower maintenance grasses. We have Bahia grass and centipede grass. And then we kind of have the standards, the St. Augustine grass and Zoysia grass. Uh, this is just a picture of my office out in Gainesville. And so I have two of the newer cultivars that I'll talk about today, uh, where we have some ongoing research on them right now. So the first one is Bahia grass. Um, and so this is kind of our dominant low maintenance grass here in Florida. Um, this is kind of the one that's used on the a lot of roadsides, uh, pastures, um, low maintenance uh, landscapes. Um, it does have kind of a coarse texture, like a wide leaf blade is what that means. Um, one of the downsides with it is that it has this open growth habit. And so if you look down into the canopy, it's not that dense kind of carpet-like look you get with other grasses, you will see some of the bare soil in between it. Um, it can be established from seed or sod, which makes it kind of advantageous, especially in low maintenance areas. Uh, but one of the other downsides is the seed head production. And so most people in Florida know what these seed heads look like. There's a picture on the next slide. Uh, another limitation of this grass is that it has poor shade tolerance. Um, and so, like I said, this is kind of the, the low maintenance grass that's used throughout the state. Um, and so it is a good option for that. It just depends on kind of what quality you're looking for. Uh, so here's just a brief list of some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so like I said, it's low input, so it's drought tolerant, low fertility needs, low maintenance. Um, it can tolerate most of our soils here in Florida, uh, but it does have some disadvantages. So those seed heads are one of the main ones, that open growth habit, um, and then it does kind of have some poor wear and salt tolerance. Um, and so if you can see in the top right, the picture, this is kind of what those seed heads look like. So they have those Y-shaped seed heads that really extend above the canopy. Um, so there is situations where, you know, your mowing frequency might only be dictated on the production of these seed heads. Uh, there's a few different cultivars that are used um, here in Florida. Um, we kind of have the Pensacola type. There's a few different uh, cultivars, but they all kind of have this characteristic. Uh, so they have narrow leaves and they have tall seed heads. And so if you look at this picture down below and you can see on the left, this is that Pensacola type. The leaves are a little bit uh, narrower and they're not as coarse. Um, and then you kind of have the Argentine type ones. And so that's the one on the right. The leaf blade's a little wider, uh, but they do have a more uniform look and produce a little less of the seed heads. Um, and so for uh, residential landscapes, if you are gonna pick Bahia grass, um, if you want more of that uniform look, uh, this is a good cultivar. So Argentine's a better cultivar in terms of that, you know, uniform landscape or turf grass that you're looking for. Kind of the other low input type grass is centipede grass. Um, this one is kind of um, just in the northern part of Florida, uh, especially in the panhandle. Um, it really likes acidic soil. And so if you get a soil test and your pH is around four and a half to five and a half, uh, this could be a good option. If it's higher than that, this grass doesn't really like it and will fail over time. Um, and so you really need to make sure that you do have acidic soil if you want to utilize centipede grass. Um, but it is another kind of lower input. Um, it tolerates the shade moderately, so a little bit better than Bahia grass. And then you can see there is a few different cultivars, but not too many relative to some of the other grasses that we use. Uh, so here's just another list of some of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, advantages, it is slow growing and it grows low, and so you don't, may not have to mow as often. Um, that can be an also a disadvantage since it is slow growing, it's slow to establish. Um, and so there is long, a longer establishment period. Uh, but like the Bahia grass, it does have low fertility needs. It's relatively cold tolerant. As you can see in the previous slide, you know, it does have a pretty far northern region. So that region, the yellow, it does extend pretty far north. Um, it can be grown from seed, sod, or plugs. So once again, it is that low maintenance type grass. Um, but some of the disadvantages, it's low growing, it's lighter in color. Um, but the main one is really it's dictated on that soil pH. Uh, so those are kind of the low maintenance type grasses that we use here in Florida. Um, they have limited cultivars. There is some breeding effort through Dr. Kenworthy's lab to uh, get some better cultivars, uh, but none of them have been released yet. Uh, so the next grass 
um, that everyone's familiar with here in Florida is St. Augustine grass. Um, you can see it has a wide range throughout the U.S. where it's utilized, uh, but it's used throughout the whole state of Florida. Uh, this is kind of the most readily usable, readily available um, type um, lawn type grass. Uh, it only has stolons, so that means it only kind of grows above the ground. It won't come back from rhizomes, which are some underground kind of stems or um, way it extends itself. Um, it is aggressive, uh, does have that coarse leaf blade. Um, and as you can see below, it does have a wide range of colors, just depending on what cultivar you select. Um, this is only really used in the lawn setting, so it's not used in golf courses or sports fields. Uh, it does have a deep root system, uh, but depending on the cultivar, you can get some winter injury. Um, and so you wanna make sure you have the right cultivar for your area. So there's a lot of advantages. It does have good shade tolerance out of the warm season grasses. Uh, this does uh, vary by cultivar, but overall it does have good shade tolerance. Uh, it tolerates a wide range of soil types and pHs. Um, and that's why you, you can see it used throughout the whole state of Florida. Uh, it establishes quickly from sod and it also has a wide range of colors. And so it does have this nice deep green or blue green color depending on which one uh, is utilized in your landscape. Some disadvantages is it's not as drought tolerant in terms of retaining green color through drought. Um, and so it will need some supplemental irrigation if we do have some drought conditions. Uh, there are some insects and some diseases that are its main targets, so chinch bug, uh, take all root rot's another one we're seeing a lot. Um, it does have poor wear, cold, and drought tolerance. Um, so if you do have big dogs that like to kind of play, I have two of them. Uh, my backyard when I started was St. Augustine grass, and they kind of beat it up, um, and so it's dying back in a lot of areas where they um, are playing, you can see exactly where their paths are in the in the backyard. And so it does have poor wear tolerance if you do have a lot of use on it. Um, and so you might wanna select a different cultivar based on what type of use you want out of your landscape. Um, and it also needs proper fertility uh, to get the right color and for health. Um, and so this one does need some fertilizer inputs. Um, it's not like the hay grass or centipede that do really well with minimal inputs. This is a little more than that, but it is a good grass and it does well throughout the state of Florida. Um, and so there's a lot of different cultivars that we can select from here in Florida. Um, we kind of have the standards on the left. So that's your Floritam. Uh, that's probably the most common throughout the state. You have Bitter Blue, Seville, Classic Palmetto. Raleigh's kind of used up in the northern part of the state. Uh, but we do have some new varieties that are getting introduce into the market here in Florida. Uh, so we have Provista, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide here. Uh, we have Citra Blue. So this one's actually released through the University of Florida uh, through Dr. Kenworthy's breeding program. Uh, it was developed in Citra, Florida, so just south of Gainesville, and it's called Blue um, just because it has a uh, distinct blue-green color, which you'll see in a few slides. Um, and some other new ones are Mata, Cobalt, and Sola. Um, cobalt's probably the one that you'll see next in the market here in Florida. Um, it seems like it'll be a really good cultivar. It'll probably be available within a year or two is what they're uh, telling me. Uh, but it has good cold tolerance, has good color, uh, does well with shade, uh, and it's really drought tolerant. And so this uh, could be a good option uh, for here in Florida and it should be available within the next couple of years. Um, one thing that we see is there's a lethal viral necrosis, which is a disease uh, for Floritam. And then once it kind of gets that, there's no real good solution other than to use a different cultivar. And so you can see the ones in the bracket are recognized as suitable replacements um, for Floritam if you do have that in your area. Um, Provista and Citra Blue um, is ongoing testing. Um, and so we think that Citra Blue will be tolerant um, and not susceptible to lethal phycrosis, uh, virus necrosis, but uh, we're not for sure on that. And so we do have some ongoing trials with that. Uh, but these are the different cultivars that are uh, being suggested right now if you do have that in your area. 
So to just go into a little uh, more information about some of those newer cultivars, uh, the first one is ProVista. And so this is released from Scott's. Um, it's genetically modified Floritam. And so a lot of the characteristics of Floritam you'll also see in this one. Besides, they did two different things to this grass. So they reduced uh, drabilic acid expression, uh, which that means is that it, it doesn't grow as fast vertically. Um, and so um, reducing this kind of hormone will actually make it so it grows uh, slower. And so that means it could have less frequent mowing. Uh, since it is growing slower, it will give it a little bit more shade tolerance. And then the other trait that they um, modified was that it's resistance to glyphosate. Uh, so this does make some weed control a little bit easier. Uh, you can apply glyphosate, which is a non-selective and get most of your targeted weeds. Um, it does have a dark green color. Um, and then, like I said, most of the other characteristics will follow along with Floratam just because it is modified from Floratam. The other new grass that's in the market is Citra Blue. So like I said, uh, this is through Dr. Kevin Kenworthy's breeding program. Here's his contact information if you have any questions about Citra Blue specifically. Um, since he's the one that developed it, he has the most insight on it. Um, and so there is uh, quite a few things that they've looked at so far. Um, and so it has good turf quality, it does have this really nice green, blue-green color. It was selected for its drought tolerance, and so it does well um, with limited water compared to some of the other cultivars. Um, and then in terms of shade, it does well in shade. It also has reduced mowing, um, and so it has a naturally low growing habit. Um, and so you'll see that in the slide here also. Um, but with that, um, it does produce a lot of thatch. And so that's one thing we're really investigating right now is how to manage this um, in landscapes to kind of combat the thatch layer it gets really spongy. So when you walk on it, it has this spongy feel to it. Um, and so we're looking at some different cultural methods. I'm looking at some different products to see if we can help alleviate that thatch problem and just make it better for uh, the end user. Uh, this is a lower mowing um, St. Augustine grass than the, the standard. Um, and so it does have a, a little bit different look compared to Floratam. And so here's just some pictures. This one's specifically looking at mowing frequency. This picture in the top left is Citra Blue. Uh, so if you notice how high the grass goes compared to these shoes, you know, it kind of sits lower. And so it is naturally low growing. Uh, the one on the right is Floratam, and you can see how much higher it is. Um, the picture here, you can see Floratam in the background and Citra Blue in the front. And so you can see uh, this is a more compact kind of dwarf type St. Augustine grass that does well with a lower mowing height compared to Floratam. Um, you can use this throughout most landscapes here in Florida. So the picture on the left, it does well in shade. Uh, here's just a picture of it around a pool area. You can see it has a nice dark green color. Um, and so that's kind of the new cultivar between ProVista and Citra Blue. Um, and then you'll start to see cobalt coming out in the future. The next common grass for residential areas is zoysia grass. Um, so you can see in this map, it has a wider range of use compared to St. Augustine grass. It goes all the way up into the Midwest, even on its northern range. Um, and that's just due because there's a lot of different uh, species of zoysia grass that kind of get lumped in together. Uh, but you can have everything from really fine textured zoysia grasses all the way to coarse textured. Um, and so it really depends on the species of grass that you have, what characteristics you're going to get from that grass. Um, and so there's, like I said, there's a lot of species, there's 11 species, but we really only use a handful here in Florida. Um, and they do have a wide range of leaf textures. So I won't go into all the actual species, but you can see um, down here, you have a more fine or intermediate bladed grass all the way to a coarse bladed grass. And these will alter management and also alter um, some of the characteristics that you get along with that. So there's some advantages and disadvantages of zoysia grass. Um, one advantage is when you have a nice healthy stand, it's very dense. Um, and so you have limited weed pressure. Um, it just kind of how it competes and it's so compact that you don't really have too many gaps in there. And so there's nowhere really for the weeds to come up from. 
Um, it's adapted to a wide range of soils, and that's why it's used throughout the state. Um, it also has good shade tolerance. Um, and so there is different cultivars that have a little better, but overall this and St. Augustine grass are kind of the two that if you do have shade in your landscape, you'd want to choose from one of these. Uh, irrigation needs are similar to St. Augustine grass. Um, Zoysia grass is extremely drought tolerant, but it does it in a different way. And so when there is drought stress, it will go semi-dormant. And so what that means is it will turn brown to survive the drought. And then as soon as we get rain again or irrigation, it will green back up. And so it will go off color um, if it doesn't get the right amount of water. Another disadvantage is it's the first grass to go off color in the fall. And so the cool temperature will make it also go semi-dormant and turn brown. Um, and then it's the last one to green up in the spring. Um, and so, that is one of the disadvantages, but it does have a lot of advantages to go along with that. Uh, this is another grass that tends to form thatch. Um, and so you do need to dethatch um, every year, every couple of years, depending on your management level. Um, and that really will help the grass uh, performance in the long run. And so there's kind of a three different um, types of zoysia grass. They're all zoysia grass. Uh, there's different species that are involved, but we kind of lump them together based on management. Um, so the first one is kind of coarse textured zoysia grass, so that wide leaf blade zoysia grass. Uh, this is the one that we typically recommend to homeowners. Um, it's less dense and less thatch than the other ones. Um, and so it has a, a little bit higher of a mowing height. And so this one we recommend around the two inch range. Um, and so it's a little bit easier for homeowners to manage a coarse textured zoysia grass. They have less inputs than the finer bladed ones. Uh, it does have good shade tolerance, good drought tolerance, um, and is good salt tolerance. Um, it does get a disease here. This is large patch. And so that is a concern with all the zoysia grasses. Uh, but this is kind of the widely used type of zoysia grass for residential landscapes. The next one is fine textured zoysia grass. Um, and so there's one species here, or it's a hybrid. Uh, these can have very fine to fine leaf blades. Um, so more of what you'd think of as a golf course type grass, um, but you can use them in some landscape areas or residential areas. Um, and for instance, if you have a lot of shade, um, this type of te uh, fine textured zoysia grass will actually do the best out of all the grasses, the warm season grasses in terms of shade tolerance. And so if you do have some heavy shade, you might want to try to utilize this around the shade. Um, in that shade, you can actually go up to a little bit higher mowing height. Um, but typically, you can see from here, it's a half inch to one and a half inches mowing height. Um, so it is more inputs. Um, and so this one isn't used as much in residential areas. It's used more on the golf course side of things. Um, but I just wanted to bring this up to your attention. And then kind of the newest one that we're seeing is we call an intermediate textured zoysia grass. Um, and so there's a different, a few different uh, cultivars is Innovation, Citrozoi, and Lobo. So once again, the University of Florida has one that's released, um, Citrozoi. Um, and so you get a little bit finer of a leaf blade compared to those coarse textured ones. Um, so you get some of those characteristics, but you get more of the management of the coarse textured. So you get the look of the fine blade, but you get the easier management of these, the wider blade and the coarse blades. So if you can see on the picture on the bottom, your kind of wide bladed ones, Empire, Icon. Um, if you look at Citrus Zoe, it's kind of in between that and the fine bladed ones. And so it gives you that more kind of dense carpet-like look. Uh, but it's a little bit easier management than the actual fine textured zoysia grasses. So like I said, one of the new ones that is out in the market now is Citra Zoi. So like Citra Blue, this was developed in Citra, Florida uh, through Kenworthy's breeding program. Um, you can see it has that medium to fine texture. Um, compared to Empire, it does a little bit better in terms of winter color, shade tolerance, um, and it does well to be produced from sod, which means it should be more available within the marketplace. And so here's just that picture um, kind of zoomed up. So you can see the coarse bladed ones over here on the right. 
the fine blades on the left and you can kind of see that citrusoy falls in between those ones so it gives you that kind of more high-end look but a little bit easier management compared to the actual fine textured zoysia grasses so here's just some more pictures uh, you can see that it does make that dense uh, canopy which really makes it hard for weed invasion So that's kind of the newest on turf cultivars. Um, the next one that we're going through a kind of similar vein of cultivars, but this is actually looking at mixed species landscapes. Um, and so we saw a need or a desire through a lot of homeowners that they want to utilize some other um, species within their landscapes. And so we're actually looking at, can we combine um, some type of forb um, with grass and see what does that actually do for us? Um, and so there's a PhD student over in West Florida uh, working with Dr. Unruh and his project is looking at these mixed landscapes um, and kind of what are the positives and negatives. Um, so for his research, he looked at um, using bahia grass in combination with perennial peanut. Um, and then he also looked at that compared to just a four mixture. So that is looking at mimosa, frog fruit, um, then he looked at centipede grass alone um, and then looked at just mulch beds and kind of what are the differences that we see, um, what are the benefits, um, and what does this actually do in a landscape. Um, so here's just the current knowledge that he shared with me. Um, so public perception, uh, they really are concerned about reducing fertilizer um, and water. And so we're trying to see if, you know, intertwining these species, we can actually achieve that. Uh, the first thing they looked at was ground temperature. So you can see in the top left here is forbs. So that's just the, the flowering plants. Uh, we have the peanut and turf here in the bottom left, uh, the turf grass alone on the right, and then mulch. So anything that had vegetation actually reduced the ground temperature compared to the mulch alone. Um, and so that is a key finding, you know, living plants around landscapes will actually kind of cool the environment compared to a mulch bed. Um, the conversion from turf grass to mulch actually resulted in nitrogen leaching. Um, and so not having any living plant material uh, resulted in that landscape actually uh, leaching some of its nutrients into the environment. And then for pollinators, the forb mixture so this top left had the greatest pollinator visits and diversity, uh, but they also saw quite a few pollinators come in this peanut and turf uh, mixture. Um, and so when they were going to this project, they wanted to decide which grasses to actually mix with. Um, I mean, which um, species they wanted to mix with the grasses and they chose legumes. So that's the perennial peanut. Uh, they did this because these plants will fix nitrogen in the soil, and so we're hoping that this would help reduce some of the fertilizer needs of uh, that landscape. And so the two that they selected was perennial peanut along in combination with bahia grass. So if you remember before, one of the limitations of bahia grass is that it has that open canopy, and so it doesn't have that dense turf grass. And so the thought is if you can mix the two in those open parts of the canopy, there could be perennial peanut. And so it seems like these two would be a good um, and easy fix because they would end up in a low maintenance type landscape. Um, and so this is what they're finding so far. If you look here, the benefits, um, which I'll get to some of these, the mixtures, so that's that turf perennial peanut mixture increased overall plot quality um, during droughts. Um, the flowers can increase the aesthetics of the landscape. Um, and then having that legume, it actually will fix nitrogen um, in that soil. And so it might be able to reduce overall uh, fertilizer needs. That part's still ongoing, uh, but we do know it's fixing um, nitrogen. And so here's just a slide looking at uh, well-watered mixes, uh, which is on the top. And then the same mixes, on in the drought conditions. And so you can see, so here's some different types of perennial peanut. We have cowboy, eco turf, and golden glory. And then we have mimosa on the right. Um, you can see when it's well watered, they all you know, have nice green color. 
Uh, but once we go into that drought conditions, you can see that the turf grass is going dormant, so it's turning brown, where some of those perennial peanuts like ecoturf here is staying green, and so that will result in a uh, better looking uh, landscape in those drought conditions when the grass is going dormant like that. Um, another positive is you can see that flowers will increase the aesthetics of the landscape. So you can see here, here's one of those mixes of the perennial peanuts. And this is that little yellow flower mixed with bahia grass. And so you can kind of see that it can be an attractive landscape. Uh, here's another picture with mimosa mixed with the turf grass. And you can see with all the flowering plants that, you know, this does increase the aesthetics of that area. Here's a slide just looking at um, fixing nitrogen. So this is looking at how much nitrogen's in the plant itself. And so the one on the left here, the blank, that's just turf grass by itself. And so you can see the total nitrogen is a little bit lower than the rest of these. The rest of these all have that mixture of that legume, that peanut or mimosa. And so you can see it will actually cause the plant to have more nitrogen, which leads us to believe um, that we might be able to reduce some of our fertilizer inputs uh, if we start to incorporate these mixes. Uh, things that they learn throughout this project um, is that legumes can be interplanted into turf successfully and they can make a nice stand. Uh, one question was, how does this tolerate mowing? And so can we still maintain them in a similar fashion to our typical landscapes? And they found out that they can be mowed at two to three inches. Uh, but they did find that these do best in more acidic soils. And so that might be a limitation in certain landscapes. Um, and then they have similar pollinators and water use to turf grass alone. So these combinations act a lot like uh, turf grass, but we do get some extra benefits. Uh, to the column on the right, there is still a lot of questions. And so weed control is one of them. Uh, because we are mixing species, um, it'd be harder to find herbicide selections that will actually get the targeted weed without uh, being detrimental to one of our uh, wanted species. Uh, there's also a look into sod production. Um, and so will, will there be an easy way for homeowners to actually um, incorporate this landscape that they want to in the future? Uh, another limitation uh, that we're starting to see is traffic tolerance. Um, and then we also don't know how these will perform in throughout the state. So this was done in the panhandle. Um, and so we need more testing locations. And then one other thing is, can we have extra benefits such as increasing soil uh, sequestration, soil uh, capture, soil carbon capture in that soil to help reduce the greenhouse gas inputs. And so here's just a picture at weed control. Um, and so this is looking at the different seasons, so summer, fall, winter, spring. Uh, the one in green is the forbs by itself. Uh, the one, uh, the orange type one is mulch alone. So you can see that mulch alone is good at uh, weed prevention. That's why we use mulch in a lot of areas. And then we have the peanut turf mix and the turf alone. Uh, one of the things that we need to look at is during establishment, the forbs and this peanut uh, turf mix did have higher weed counts um, and so that will be a limitation while they're getting established uh, but you can see as we go from summer fall winter spring once we get to spring everything's fully established uh, that these mixes are relatively low and weed control it's more during that establishment phase uh, that there'll be extra efforts towards weed control another thing that we need to look at is traffic tolerance so here's just a picture of uh, a mimosa on the side of you know roadway here you can see where people are walking on that that this doesn't perform as well and so we need to more research on uh, what combination could be used if there is going to be some more traffic in this area um, and so here is the contact information for augustine who's the phd student um, if you have any specific questions about these mixes um, he would be a good option to reach out to um, he knows the ins and outs of this project. Um, and so if you are interested in that combination of perennial peanut mixed with uh, bahia grass or anything like that, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, the next part of the talk, we're gonna kind of move away from 
the cultivars, the mixed lawns. And we're going to go into some of the other things that we have going on at the University of Florida. Uh, so the first thing is nutrition and fertilization, best management practices. Um, and so we're really trying to change the mindset around this and change um, some of our tools that we are using um, to actually make our recommendations. Um, but our overall goal is to use the minimal amount of nutrients to get the, the turf grass quality that we want. Um, and then also apply these um, so that the plants will actually use them. We don't waste any of these nutrients that we are applying. Um, and so we've been using uh, kind of this picture below to kind of change the mindset of it's more of a balancing act of inputs and outputs. And so if we look at inputs, uh, we're looking at you know what's in the soil and so if you picture this blue box which is plant available nutrients you can picture this as your soil we really want to balance what we're putting into that area and then what's uh, being outputted so that it's kind of a net neutral and we still get the turf grass that we want uh, so the first step of that is minerals from the soil or what's in your soil um, and so that will lead me into the next few slides um, and then from that, we go into kind of fertilizer recommendations um, and and or if you have reclaimed water, um, we also need to start to incorporate that into our uh, nutrition plans. Uh, and then we're learning more and more that uh, these landscapes are getting some nutrition from the atmosphere or rain itself. And then also uh, the organic matter that's in that soil um, is actually releasing nutrients. And so I have ongoing projects looking at um, the organic matter in the soil and how much of that is actually becoming available to the plant um, in hopes that we can start to alter some of our management based on landscape age um, and organic matter in that soil. So these inputs, uh, we want to kind of balance the outputs. And so we know every time we clip it, if we remove those clippings, we remove a little bit of the, nu the nutrients. Uh, we're still trying to quantify the exact amount, but we do know there, there are nutrients in those clippings. Uh, there's gaseous losses from the soil. Uh, some of these nutrients can be converted uh, into unavailable forms. Um, and then we also have leaching and runoff. And this is the one thing that we're really trying to minimize um, within this whole equation. Um, and so the new thing that we have to kind of help with, you know, understanding what's in your soil is we have a new uh, UF IFAS branded soil test kit. Uh, so there's a partnership between University of Florida and soilkit.com. Um, and this actually is a new soil test that we're using in turf grass areas. Um, and it's more user friendly. Um, and I'll show you some slides of kind of what the interface looks like. Um, and so this is newer um, and this is kind of the one we're recommending for turf grass um, it's a little bit easier to use um, and some of the cool things that it's doing is it actually links you to our edis documents about um, our recommendations and then it also will link you to the fertilizer ordinance app and so if you get a soil test and you're in a county that has a fertilizer ordinance um, it will actually kind of give you like a warning showing that you know you might not be able to apply fertilizer in this time in your county. Um, and so that's just one useful thing that we're trying to do to make um, soil testing and recommendations based off that more user friendly. And so I just went on and looked at um, a soil test and this is one uh, just to kind of show you guys the interface. Um, and so when you get a soil test back, there's a few different tabs. There's one you can actually look to see what's in your soil and then there's one on um, what are the recommendations that you should apply. Um, and so this is what's in the soil. And so you can see there's an easy graph that kind of gives you the high low that we're kind of used to. Um, and then you can kind of select what units you want in the bottom It actually will give you the numbers. Um, so you can see phosphorus is at 120 parts per million or PPM. Um, and you'll see that this is far above our threshold. Um, and so you won't want to apply phosphorus in this landscape. So if you keep that in mind, uh, you'll see the recommendations later on. Another one is potassium. So you can see potassium is about 28. Um, and so you can see this is on the lower range. So once again, if you keep that in mind um, on this next few slides, you'll see kind of what are the recommendations. 
So if you click on the analysis tab at the top, you'll actually see your annual treatment needs. Um, and so this is in parts per million. And so if I was gonna actually go apply this, I'd switch the tab over to this pounds per thousand square feet. And it would give you the total amount of nitrogen, uh, potassium and anything else that um, would be recommended based off your soil test. Um, if you click on the product recommendations, um, you can actually kind of fine tune this to whatever products you like using. Um, but the cool thing about it is that you can put in your actually square footage of your lawn, uh, what type of grass it is, and it will go through and it will actually tell you the exact amount that you should be applying to your lawn. And so this kind of takes out a lot of the math for you. Um, and so in this landscape area, uh, you would apply this much. And so you can either purchase two 20 pound bags, a 40 pound bag, and you can have different options of the actual fertilizers that you want to apply or the brands that you like. And so it, it gives you a more user friendly where it takes out a lot of the math in the, the equation here. And it just kind of gives you, you know, what's in your soil and here's the recommendations uh, through um, UF IFAS. And so we don't uh, recommend any specific brands. And so that's all can be fine tuned by the user. Uh, we just recommend on um, what nutrients should be applied. And so, like I said, if you are within a certain uh, county that does have those ordinances, you will get this little warning sign. And so that will forward you over to here and you can actually find out uh, what is your fertilizer ordinance um, and whether you can apply those nutrients during that time period or not. Um, and so there's a few different ways you can get that. You can go online, you can do it on your phone, uh, you can pop up, it'll locate you, and you can actually see what ordinance you have in your county. Um, so there's been some updates in our nitrogen recommendations. Um, and so if you can see the ones that are in green here, here's kind of the table of uh, what region of Florida you're in, what grass you have, and then there's a range of how much nitrogen per year uh, we recommend. Uh, and this is based off uh, lawn quality. Um, and so that high end is if you really are trying to make the, the nicest lawn you can, the lower end is kind of the bare maintenance. Um, but it is your landscape. You can apply zero if you want to apply zero, uh, but we don't recommend getting above that yearly total. Uh, but you can see these ones that are in green, so the Bahia grass, um, these are actually reduced within the last year. Um, and so our maximum uh, nitrogen per year is two pounds per thousand square feet per year for Bahia grass, and this was just lowered recently. Um, and so I just wanted to have this slide to point that out. Um, another thing that we get asked a lot is uh, when to apply them. And so this is just a, a brief graph looking at the growth rate of these grasses. And so if you look here, if you're looking around February, you can see that all of them have reduced growth potential. And then as you get into the summer months, you can see they all are maxing out in their growth potential. And so that makes sense. We have warm season grasses. They like to grow when we're in our warm season. Um, and so just be uh, cognizant of when you want to apply fertilizers, try to apply them, you know, when the grass is actually growing. Um, if we're applying it when they're not growing, uh, we're wasting our nutrients and there's more likelihood that they're going to be lost to the environment. So we always want to recommend applying nutrients while the grass is actually growing. Um, here's a slide that's just kind of our baseline recommendations. Uh, so nitrogen, you go to that table, you find out what grass you want or what you have in your landscape. You find what region you are in Florida and that's our recommendations on nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus, so this has been changed recently that we would recommend applying phosphorus if your test is below 20 parts per million. Um, and so this was recently changed um, with our soils in Florida. Most of them are higher in phosphorus. And so we really don't look to apply extra phosphorus. And so we only recommend applying phosphorus if it's below this 20 parts per million. Uh, potassium, we say apply if it's below 40 parts per million. Um, or as a maintenance type program, you could apply at a two to one or one to one ratio of nitrogen to potassium. So what that means is on your fertilizer bag, 
Um, just some random numbers. Uh, a 30 0 15 would be two to one. Um, and a one to one would be a 15 0 15. So the fertilizer bag, uh, the first number goes with the nitrogen content. So if it's 15, that means there's 15% nitrogen in the fertilizer. Uh, the middle number is uh, phosphorus. And so we are always trying to look for that zero there unless your soil test is below 20 parts per million. And then that last number is the potassium level. And so if you want a one-to-one -one ratio, it'd be 15, zero, 15. Um, in terms of magnesium, only apply it if your soil test is below 20 parts per million. Um, sulfur, only apply if it's less than seven parts per million. Um, and then all the other nutrients, we really don't have thresholds. And so it's hard to say um, if you'll see a turf response by applying extra nutrients. Um, and so that is something to think about before you are selecting a fertilizer. Uh, the next part is reclaimed water. Um, and so this is another professor down in South Florida, uh, Dr. Marco Scavon. Um, and so he has a project looking at reclaimed water. Um, and so that's those purple pipes you'll see in the landscape. Um, so one thing we know about reclaimed water is that it will have nutrients. And so the first thing you'd wanna do if you are using reclaimed water is you'd wanna get your water test to see how much nutrients you actually have in there. Um, Cause in some circumstances, based on how much you're watering, you could actually reduce how much fertilizer that landscape needs or eliminate the amount of fertilizer. Um, but it also is based seasonally. And so these water qualities change. And so you'd wanna frequently get, um, you know, water testing or water, uh, the, the results of the water testing to see the nutrients that are available. Uh, there are some equations so that if you are using reclaimed water and you have the results, um, you can figure out how much nutrients you're putting out and how much you need to supplement with traditional fertilizer. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to re reach out to me and I can kind of point you in the right direction. Um, but he has a research project looking at uh, turf grass performance and nutrient leaching uh, re using this reclaimed water. So he's looking at Bermuda grass for more golf courses, um, and then he's looking at St. Augustine grass. And so uh, this is an ongoing project um, trying to look at um, how do we make some better recommendations for people that are on reclaimed water. And so within the next year or two, we should have some more definitive answers about best management practices, but this is kind of the ongoing project right now. What am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, the next one, um, this will kind of go into the soil amendments. And so this is where more of my research kind of falls in place with. Uh, this first one is looking at research from Dr. Evan Bean. Um, and this is looking at compost soil incorporation. So if you're in a new landscape or you're building a new home, um, you know, what are things we could do to that landscape to help save water in the future? And so he looked at uh, different treatments of either soil incorporation of compost or not. Um, and so he looked at nine different homes. He left three compacted. So he just left the soil as is from the construction process, uh, didn't do anything to it and put sod on top of it to see kind of what happened. Excuse me. Uh, he did three houses where he just tilled that top portion of the soil. It didn't add anything to it, just tilled it to see if that would help break up that soil compaction. And then he tilled in three with compost, so adding that organic matter. Uh, his main focus was looking at water savings. And so this graph, uh, the main takeaway is that he's really trying to increase this gray portion so the plant available water in that soil. So how much water in that soil could actually be utilized by the plants. And so he's trying to increase this range. And so that the ultimate goal is maybe you could get away with less irrigation in these landscapes. So here's this graph uh, looking at that plant available water. So this gray portion here will turn into the green portion on this graph. Um, so if we're going left to right, you can see that this null treatment that was just the compaction didn't do anything to the soil. 
Uh, you can see it has relatively low plant available water holding capacity. And so we're at 0 0.08 ish. Um, if you just till the soil, you see a minimal improvement, but nothing really that drastic. Uh, his thought was even though you're tilling and breaking up that compaction, since there's no organic matter, the soil structure just settles back down and it gets compacted again. Um, but we do see this big increase um, when we actually incorporate that compost. So we're doubling the plant available water holding capacity of that soil by adding or tilling in that compost. And so that was a kind of a good prove it, prove the theory works. Uh, but he wanted to go into, will this actually result in being able to reduce irrigation and landscapes? And so he went into the field, a field study. So you can see all these little squares. These all have different irrigation levels and different compost treatment levels. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through the results he was finding. Um, and so we're taking visual turf grass ratings. Um, you can see kind of what they represent. A three over here, you can see a lot of brown grass. Eight, you know, it's kind of the high end. Uh, for his study, he said anything that was above a five uh, would be acceptable for most homeowners. And so that was kind of his, his cutoff line. So this first one we're looking at is, so all of these, uh, we have the control, which is the gray bar down here. So that did not get um, compost added into the soil. And then all these colored ones are just different types of compost or different brands. Um, and then we wanted to see, you know, what was the result? So this first one is looking at 100% reduction in irrigation, which means they, you know, they established this landscape um, and then they turned off the water and they wanted to see, do we get enough natural rainfall um, to supplement enough water for this turf grass? Um, and the result was um, just turning off the irrigation, um, it didn't receive enough water. So none of these treatments, the compost incorporation, it didn't get it above that five threshold that uh, he was kind of saying was a, acceptable for homeowners. So he figured out you couldn't just turn off the water. This, you know, there's not enough frequent water. There's enough drought periods where that wasn't a good option. <clears throat> so the next one was a 75% reduction. So he only put back 25% of our typical uh, recommended watering. And so this is reducing a lot of water. Uh, you can see that only for about one to two months did that grass get above that threshold. Um, and there's quite a bit of air in some of these readings because they are visual uh, ratings. Um, and so he deemed that 75% reduction was still too much. Uh, there wasn't enough water being put out to actually get it above uh, acceptable quality. Uh, but this is where he kind of found the next um, sweet spot, I guess you would say. He looked at a 50% reduction, and you can see as we warm up, they're kind of coming out of that winter uh, dormancy or semi dormancy. And you can see as we get into the summer months, all of the ones that got compost were above that five threshold, and the control was below it. Uh, so this indicates that if you can compost amend uh, your soil, uh, once it's established, you might be able to get away with reducing your irrigation inputs by 50%. So that's a significant savings throughout the year. Uh, you took it a step further, you looked at only a 25% reduction. Um, as you can see, even the control was getting above that threshold. And so he's saying that somewhere between 25 to 50% reduction um, is what you could probably attain by um, incorporating compost into your soil before installing a landscape. Um, and so that's great if you can get to your landscapes before, um, but that's not always the case. And so we wanted to look at um, compost top dressing. So can we in incorporate compost later on and still get some of those benefits? And so they did a brief little study, um, him and AJ Reisinger, uh, just looking at different top dressing um, one, two, or three times per year, um, and what does that do to some of the soil characteristics? Um, and so we're looking at um, just the overall results is that top dressing started to increase soil organic matter, um, so that makes sense. 
but the downside is that this compost does have a lot of nutrients in it. And so it was increasing soil phosphorus levels. Um, as we remember from before, a lot of our landscapes in Florida, we don't need to add more phosphorus to it. And so this is something we need to think about um, while we're adding compost into this landscape and for top dressing. Um, and so a lot of my research is actually looking at uh, the nutrient side of the compost and how can we alter fertilizer recommendations if we are going to start to utilize compost. Um, and so I started the trial this year with Dr. Bean. Um, and so we're looking at compost top dressing for lawns and we're looking at compost with or without fertilizer incorporation. Um, and this is all just top dressing, so we're not court, uh, tilling it into the soil beforehand. Um, and then we're looking at, can we, for one, replace some of our fertilizer usage, and two, can we actually start to save irrigation just by top dressing? And so we just started that this year, um, so it will be an expansive study. You can see we used a big area, um, and so we should have a lot of meaningful results within the next year or two, um, but we just got this started. Um, so I'm excited to see, you know, can we save water just by top dressing, and can we save fertilizer inputs by top dressing compost. Uh, with the last few minutes, I'll just kind of cruise through these ones. Um, some more of my research is I like to look at alternative fertilizer sources. Um, and so can we use somebody's byproduct to make a more sustainable fertilizer? Um, and so the first one that I've worked with quite a bit um, is a company that uses algae to clean wastewater. And so this picture on the left, you can see these are these belts that go in and out of wastewater and they grow algae and bacteria on it. And as it goes into the water, the algae and bacteria will take up nutrients and then they get out of the water because uh, it speeds up the process of how fast they can produce algae and bacteria to clean that water. Uh, but the result of that is they have a lot of algae and bacteria um, that they scrape off and dry and they don't really have a use for because they're only focused about cleaning the water itself. Um, and so they came to work with me saying, can we use this kind of byproduct um, as a landscape fertilizer? And so we started to look at, can we use this in a turf area? Uh, so the first thing we went to is a greenhouse, uh, just working left to right. We have their pure algae is what we called it. That was just their product. We dried it down, uh, made it into pellets. And you can see it does have a pretty good turf response. Uh, the next product was algae plus a cellulosic filler. We called this blended. Um, we added this filler because it kind of held the pellet together and made it less dusty. If anybody's worked with the next product, Melorganite, um, you know it, it will become dusty over time. It's not the most user-friendly to apply. Uh, Melorganite is another wastewater product out of Milwaukee. Um, and so these are similar type products and you can see they both performed well. Uh, here is urea alone and then non-treated. So you can see we are getting a positive turf response with this algae product. And so then we moved it to the field. Um, you can see I did this in both cool season grasses and warm season grasses. So the one on the left is a Kentucky bluegrass, a cool season grass. The one on the right was a warm season grass, a zoysia grass, and you can see, you know, these dark squares are where we applied this algae product. And so you can see it is releasing nutrients. Um, so it might be a more sustainable fertilizer source than using synthetics. Another company I'm working with uh, does wet milling of corn, potatoes, um, and soybeans. Um, and so they have a lot of byproducts associated with that. Um, and so I once again, started in the greenhouse, and we're looking at, can we use uh, these vegetable protein byproducts um, as a liquid fertilizer um, and try to get into that market also beyond more of a traditional pellet ones like the algae. Um, and so for this, um, because it is a company and these are some of their blends, uh, they just gave me vegetable protein A, B, and C. Um, so I don't know if it's corn, potato, um, a combination. Uh, but we just applied these products to see, you know, what turf response we had in the greenhouse. And you can see the above ground growth was significantly higher than the non-treated and nitrogen alone. Uh, that's likely due to because these 
uh, proteins have um, a lot of different types of nutrients. So they have phosphorus, potassium, um, and so it's not just a nitrogen source. And on the bottom of these graphs are actually uh, root scans. And so you can see that it not only increased the above ground growth, but it's also increasing the root growth. Um, and so with that, um, I've been using their products here on different trials from golf course putting greens to residential areas. And so um, we're testing out a lot of these alternative fertilizers on the grasses here in Florida. So the St. Augustine zoysia grass. Um, and so I'm looking to you know, really try to make some of our practices more sustainable also. Um, and with that, that's what I have for you today in terms of turf updates. Um, I'd like to thank you for being here and having me. Um, here's my email. Like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll try to help out the best I can or point you in the right direction. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. All right. Uh, that was a great um, presentation. Um, I got a lot of positive feedback uh, while you were speaking. Um, let me uh, let me go see here where the where it starts. Um, okay, we uh, when you were talking about Saint Augustine, uh, Saint Augustine grass, she uh, somebody said I see the word aggressive and wonder about using it. Will St. Augustine grass spread into areas of mulch, flowers, landscapes, and et cetera? And is it rhizomous? So St. Augustine grass, for the first part, uh, it will spread. Um, it depends on your mulch bed, um, but it doesn't have rhizomes. So it only has still ones, so it only spread above ground. Um, but it will spread into some mulch beds or um, even though it's try to spread across, you know, sidewalks and everything else too. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of companies will edge the landscapes because it will, it will try to spread, uh, particularly this time of year where it's hot and it's sunny. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is um, just a part of St. Augustine grass. All right. Um... All right, and uh, is Provista resistant to LVN? That we do not know for sure. And so we have ongoing sites that Provista was put into areas known to have LVN, um, but we don't know for sure. It's too early to tell. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh... Which grass is best for full sun with no shade? Um, any of the grasses. So okay. all of our grasses love full sun. Uh, there's only certain ones that will tolerate shade. So even mm -hmm. if a grass, we say it's shade tolerant, it will also handle full sun just fine. Okay. Uh, we had a comment. Love this mixing in the natives. Uh, very cool. Um, Let's see. Uh, I am interested to know if the perennial or if the peanut would eventually just overrun the turf because it's aggressive. Um, so potentially, yes. Uh, we do see that in a lot of landscapes that the peanut, mimosa, um, that is one of our limitations or reasons why we're hesitant sometimes to put it into a landscape because mm -hmm. it will spread it. Um, it didn't take over these plots, but this is only over a three year period. And so I can't say it won't take them over fully over a longer time period. Um, but we do see landscapes around the area that have a mixture of the two still. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's hard to say, um, but that is one of the reasons if you do put this in your landscape, uh, probably be ready to commit to it because they are very aggressive. So. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, when is the best time or way to plant peanut? I'm, I'm guessing perennial peanut. Um, the best time, I don't know that for sure. Um, the way the study worked is they just put in plugs. Mm -hmm. um, so in that Bahia grass, uh, there is some of those open canopy parts of it. You could just put in plugs into that okay. area. Um, but timing, I am 
I'd probably contact Augustine um, okay. and he would have a better idea. Okay. And um, the, the peanut plugs will just uh, grow outwards and cover yeah, more. So, yeah. So um, if you go back, if you are going to do some peanut, there is some different cultivars, just like there's different cultivars mm -hmm. for grasses. And there is some peanuts that do have rhizomes. Mm -hmm. And so those ones did better overall. And since they have rhizomes, they will start to spread themselves. Um, okay. And so it's kind of like if you've ever seen plugging of um, turf grass to fill in a lawn, mm -hmm. it's the same idea. You just use plugs and they'll start to fill in themselves. Okay. Uh, reclaim, reclaimed water with nutrients. Should we be using less than nominal amount of fertilizer? That is a complex question. Um, mm. Reclaimed water changes a lot throughout the year, uh, for one. Um, two, it depends on what treatment level the reclaimed water has. Um, and so there is some advanced treatments that have minimal nutrients. And so fertilizer recommendations wouldn't change too much. Uh, but there's other reclaimed water sources that have a lot of nutrients and that can replace fertilizer totally. Um, and so I can't have a blanket statement. It really would depend on getting your water tested and then doing the calculations after that. I think you can also contact your local utility company and they might be able to tell you uh, what's in your, your reclaimed water from what yeah, I understand. Yeah. If you can get a good contact within that mm -hmm. where you could ask them you know, monthly, Mm -hmm. because it will change drastically will change. from throughout the year. Um, okay. If you think about in the winter, we normally have higher nutrients in our water uh, sure. because we have more visitors. Um, sure. So in the summer, the nutrients kind of tail off in a lot of the areas. Um, and so getting it tested throughout the year or, or calling to have the results throughout the year, I should say, would is uh, one thing you'd want to do. Okay. Uh, let's see. What is the application rate for top dressing? For top dressing, um, the rate that we're using right now is a half a cubic yard per thousand square feet. Um, there's okay. not, there's a few different rates. Uh, you can go a little bit higher, a little bit lower than that. Um, that's just kind of the one we picked in the middle. Um, but there's not a real good rate study out there yet. Um, okay. So that's just our recommendation right now that we're using is half a cubic yard per thousand. Okay. All right. Uh, since we have, uh, since we are having a longer drought condition in Southwest Florida, is the, is UF going to start making recommendations to counties, HOAs, et cetera, to start going eco-friendly with lawns or planting suggestions, more gravels, less sod, water is becoming scarce? Um, that I can't answer. I, th uh, I think we pretty much do that at, at FFL, at Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, we uh, have, you know, a, a, an application uh, that's web-based or native-based. You can look up uh, different plants you're thinking about uh, planting, and it'll tell you whether they're drought tolerant or not. And also uh, gravel, uh, we do not support the use of gravel as a, uh, as a yard or a lawn uh, or a mulch. Um, it just creates um, heat pockets uh, and you'll have a lot of weeds coming up through there. So you'll have to use pesticide or you'll have to hand, uh, hand pull all of those weeds. Uh, we do recommend that for pathways or for around your house. And I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you as you were, you were oh, uh, finishing. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, in terms of the turf grasses too, we're doing a lot of work on selecting drought tolerant ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a big part of our efforts. Um, and then it's also dictated on your landscape. Um, like my landscape, I don't water at all. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's times of the weeks or, you know, parts of the month where my grass is dormant, but that's, it is what it is. Um, and so it really depends on what you also want out of your landscape. Yeah, I do the same thing. 
Uh, do you test uh, for heavy metals when you're using the sewage treatment source, I think, for fertilizing? Yep, yep. So when I tested those, I did test for heavy metals. Um, I tested for anything I thought would be either bad for the environment or bad for the plant. Um, and they all came under the thresholds of any other thing that we could apply um, in terms of fertilizers. Um, and so I did test those. Um, and so that was a concern that and along with salt uh, were the main concerns and um, they were both came back fine. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, what if you live in an HOA community, will you be allowed to use any other fill in turf plants like, like uh, perennial peanut? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, if you live, let's see, if you live in an HOA, uh, will you be allowed to use any other fill, uh, fill in turf plants? Uh, I think you have to look in your HOA. Yeah. Um, look in your codes, what, covenants, and restrictions. Yeah. Like my, I'm in an HOA and mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. No. Um, it'd be something I'd, you'd have to bring it up to the mm -hmm. HOA and see if they would allow it. But yeah. yeah. So that's going to be dependent on what you, HOA or community you're in. Yeah, um, definitely look at your uh, codes, covenants, and restrictions before you do anything to your uh, your landscape. Um, what's the cost on composts like command? I'm I'm not sure. Command is a type of compost. Okay. Um, commands through life soils. I don't have the exact price on. Okay. What That's they all right. have. So I know they, okay. you can look it up online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, will they have a field day in Citra this year? Do you have any idea? Yeah, we okay. are planning to. Uh, it should be October 4th, um, unless a hurricane comes again. Then, we're, <laughs> then we'll have to postpone it again. But we, we have the date uh, set. And so we're through, going through the planning right now. Okay. Uh, what about perennial peanut put in root rot home landscape? Um, that I, I don't think anyone's tried it. Um, <laughs> it's a different root system. Um, so it might work, uh, okay. but I haven't had anybody try that. Okay. Um, Uh, let's see. Um, you mentioned the best time to apply fertilizer is when the grass is growing, but that coincides with the blackout period. Does this mean that the blackouts would be more appropriate for the cooler weather months rather than in the warmer, where, warmer months when grass is growing aggressively? I know that's sort of a touchy subject it's a the very moment. Touchy subject. Mm -hmm. um, Based on previous research at the University of Florida, um, especially with Dr. Unruh's work, um, he found that more potential for losses were in the cooler months um, and minimal losses happened in the warm months. Um, and so in general, um, that is our recommendation is to apply it when you can, but the ordinances uh, dictate that over anything that we could recommend. And so, um, yeah, the ordinances are what they are. Um, and so, you know, try to work around them as best you can. And aren't, aren't there, hasn't there been money uh, allocated to study blackout periods through this legislative, legislative yeah, session? Yeah, so that's, that's coming up this year. And so, um, not sure exactly what that entails, but yes, there was money to look at and see, you know, what are they actually doing? Okay. Um, does water pH play a part in this discussion? Uh, yeah. So some, if you're talking about irrigation sources. I, I think so, yeah. Um, it can. Um, if your water has a lot of carbonates and it's a high pH over time, that can alter your soil pH. Um, but you know, I don't know the rate at what it does. Um, okay. And so I think okay. that's something uh, uh, Dr. Marco would be a good person to ask. Okay, all right. 
Uh, one more question. I am about to put down zoysia sod. I would like to add compost to my dirt before adding the sod on top. What kind of compost and can I get it from Home Depot or Lowe's? I, the ones that I've worked with, I have not gotten from Com or from Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, that's one of the issues that we have right now is we don't have a set type of standard. Um, the one thing that Dr. Bean has told me is to make sure you select one that's certified. Um, and so there is a compost certified sources. So if you just look up certified compost Florida, there's a website and it will give you all the certified sources. Um, and okay. that's just for quality insurance. Um, and if you use one of those, it should work the same. Um, but that's, as, that's the best we have right now. Okay. And a lot of people would like your uh, slides to this presentation. I do, um, I did say that uh, we were, we would be recording this. It will be on our website and on our YouTube channel, uh, probably by the end of the week. Um, but if you would like to share slides, um, you can send them to me and, and people can uh, email me back. But I, I understand if you, um, you know, would, would like to keep the slides, you know, as your own, so. Oh, I can send you them in a PDF, that's fine. Okay, that'd be great. And if, if you all would like them, uh, my email address is on one of the notices that you got for this uh, webinar. So, um, Dr. Lindsay, thank you so much for um, explaining turf grass updates to us and uh, for participating in our homeowner webinar series. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day to everybody. All right. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.